Welcome to this evening's uh, school board business meeting on Tuesday, April 14th. May you please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So before we begin, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, I would like to suggest one um, adjustment to the agenda this evening. Under communications, item 5A, we have a number of folks here for recognition this evening. Um, I'm suggesting that we move the recognitions up to just after item 3, um, before public comments from the public and just after comments from our school board representatives. How do the rest of you folks feel about that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so moving along, um, any other adjustments to the agenda? Item two, may I have a motion to approve the school board minutes? Yes, you may. Uh, I uh, make a motion to approve the school board minutes as listed under agenda item uh, 2A, B, C, D, and E. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Item number three, comments by our student representatives. Um, okay, so we are getting really close to April break. We have like a day and a half left, which is really nice. Um, and then when we get back, it's so going to be really busy. We have I know elections for student council are coming up in early June. We have the AP exams, um, which are like the second week we get back from break. And then uh, a lot of the juniors are taking the SATs in May, uh, and then finals. So it's going to be really busy. But uh, I think spring sports are starting. I want to say over April break is most most teams' first like competitions. I know that like preseason has started and most of the teams are practicing, but I don't think um, there have been any actual games or matches yet. Um, and when we get back from April break, I think almost all the seniors will have decided where they're going to go to school next year, because um, I know the deadline for that is May, either May 1st or 2nd. So I think most of the seniors right now already know where they're going, um, which is really exciting for them. So we're in the home stretch, I think. So that's exciting. <laughs> and that's about it. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, wonderful. So, um, according to our adjustments to the agenda, we have recognitions this evening from the Cape Special Olympics and Winter Athletes. So our, our Special Olympians are going to join us in May. How about Senator Millette is here to share some other recognitions for our Winter Athletics? I'm back. Did we break the printer again? <sighs> um, no, the moratorium has been lifted. Uh, but no thanks to us, I'm afraid. <laughs> and we have more coming, so you're going to get to see me again in May. Um, and I noticed that you folks are going to be looking at the um, calendar this evening, and I wanted to share with you that we had some interesting testimony last week on the idea of um, start times, later start times for the high school. And um, I assured them that it was not the end of the world if high school started a little bit later. Um, it's possible for sports teams and extracurricular groups to excel, and I think we have proof of that time and time again here in this district. Um, it will be interesting to, to see how all of that plays out. So this evening, I am very pleased to recognize a number of achievements, and first, I wonder if there's anybody here from the boys' swim team. Would you like to come up and join me? Great. So I understand um, it gets a little monotonous to read all the fancy dancy language, but I'm going to do it once for the first, the first one, and then I'll try to summarize for the other ones. But. <clears throat> So be it known, oh, first, and also I'd just like to say that uh, this evening we're going to be recognizing um, three teams that have shown an incredible, incredible perseverance, true grit, 
uh, never say never say die attitudes and endurance and training um, and cooperation and teamwork and it's just it's really inspiring uh, to read about all of these amazing young um, members of our community and, and what they've done with with their teams so with that be it known to all that we the members of the Senate and House of Representatives join in recognizing the Cape Elizabeth High School boys swim team which has won the Class B state championship this the team's seventh championship victory is the team's first since 1997 members of the team include Stephen Bennett Thomas Brett Andrew Her uh -oh, Herrera Harry Oh, Homans, Kyle Long, Sam Loring, Reese McFarland, Elliot McGinn, Alexander Mukai, Wyatt Page, James Planasek, Robert Sarka, Connor Thorick, and or or Owen Thorick, assistant coaches David Croft and Alina Perez Smith, and coach Ben Raymond. We extend to all the members of the team our congratulations and best wishes, and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 127th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. And this is signed by Michael Thibodeau, President of the Senate, Mark Eves, Speaker of the House, sponsored by myself, and um, Representative Monaghan and Representative Hammond, um, both of whom I believe are still caught up in the committee meetings in Augusta, otherwise they would be here to congratulate. So, so congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize if I stumble on names or mispronounce. It's in this very old um, font that makes it quite challenging to read, especially H's or K's. OK, so moving on to the girls' alpine ski team. Okay, so be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, join in recognizing the Cape Elizabeth High School girls' alpine ski team, which has won the Class B state championship. This is the team's second straight championship victory. Members of the team include Liv Clifford, Kenan McGrath, Sarah Keniston, Emma Landis, Caroline Packlett, Emma Dvorzniak, and Haley Fawcett, and Coach Jeff Davis. We extend to all the members of the team our congratulations and best wishes, and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 127th Legislature and the people of the state of Maine. Congratulations. Rebecca, I also just wanted to note that a number of those names that you read were also known as what they call ski meisters. So not only did they go and help the team win the state championship, but they also competed doing Nordic skiing as well. So That's fantastic. We have some pretty busy winter Olympics. It's a hardy group. Hardy group. Because <laughs> yes. it's cold out there. Yes, it's very cold. It was. And still may be. Sorry. Okay. And the basketball team coming up. So be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, join in recognizing the Cape Elizabeth boys basketball team, which has won the Class B state championship. This, the outcome of a memorable and dramatic game, is the team's first championship victory since 1988. Members of the team include James Bottomley, Finn Bow, Marcus Donnelly, Edward Galvin, Matthew Graham, Justin Garrett, Ryan Harvey, Bryce Hewitt, Quinn Hewitt, Nate Ingalls, Joseph Inhorn, Grady McCormick, Ethan Murphy, Jack O'Rourke, Marshall Peterson, Nathan Spicer, Brendan Tinsman, and Vince Tarpo, and Coach Jim Ray. We extend to all the members of the team our congratulations and best wishes, and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 127th Legislature and the people of the state of Maine. Congratulations. That's it for this evening. I will be returning, lucky you, in uh, May with some more sentiments. We know when you come, it's always good. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to mention it? Did we have a question? Yeah. 
we just want to see it. I don't know if any of the coaches or players or athletic director Thorek wanted to make any comments about their seasons before they left, but we certainly want to give you the opportunity to do that. Um, I think we also perhaps want to give a shout out to Coach Ray for getting uh, Coach of the Year in Maine. Am I correct? Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> That's always so much fun. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, item number four on our agenda is comments from the public on agenda items. Do we have any comments from the public on any of the items on the agenda this evening? My name is Liza Quinn, and I have a couple comments in addition to the um, letters that I've written in or the, or the emails, and it has to do with the proposed class size for the rising fifth grade. As you know, um, it's proposed that uh, a teacher is dropped, so currently in the fourth grade there are six teachers. It's proposed to drop to five. Um, today there are 114 students enrolled in the fourth grade. Um, your projections are for 112, so the budget is for 112 students. And um, the report that was paid for by Planning Decisions ha um, projects 116 students. Now, um, if it's 112 or 116, we're going to have class sizes, homeroom sizes, of 22 to 24, which is the same number of students, according to the directory, that is in um, the fifth grade today. Now, in the fifth grade today, there's a math class with either 27 or 26 kids. I've got um, conflicting reports on the size of that class. It, that's too many children, especially for um, the new curriculum, which is still in development. And I believe that you, you're addressing that large math class by adding half a teacher to that grade. So the rising sixth graders, you will have addressed the class size issue in math. However, what leads us to believe that we're not going to have the same class size issue for math next year? We have the same dynamic where kids are grouped according to abilities. And unless by some magic stroke of luck, the apportionment of kids that are grouped in abilities is the same, is, is equally, is, is the same for advanced math and regular math, we're going to have the same class size problem. So I ask you, how are you applying different logic to this cohort when it comes to math? What will, what, what will the solution be if the kids are grouped in such a way that there will be a class that is much bigger than the 22 in the guideline? Or are you suggesting grouping kids in math, not according to ability, but in order to solve for class sizes? And I would like to see that discussed. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Volz, and I was just going to make a, another brief comment on a similar topic, and just because I believe it would be helpful. You're forecasting one of the largest decreases in student population that you forecast for the last several years. The last time you forecast one this big, you got about 25 percent of that. So I'm not saying the forecast is wrong, but I do think it would be helpful to just briefly make clear what the process is when class, when student population size turns out to be bigger than expected and how new teacher staff is added and how that happens. So that I, I know there is a process. I think making that clear would be very helpful to the class size discussion. Thank you. My name is Audra Welton and I too want to discuss class size. The current third grade class is chocked full to overflow and the same thing is being predicted for the fourth as they move into fourth grade we need one more teacher for them it if you look at how the school board makes the decision about class size and the suggestion for the number of students part of the reasoning in that that's written within that document is be, points toward the success of the kids their education as well as satisfaction of teachers. Well, we have a problem with both right now. Our school is a monitor school. 
not meeting the full testing, and our teachers are not in a good place. They're not satisfied. I think this needs to be addressed. I asked other parents. There are over 70 third grade parents who are requesting, please add another teacher for fourth grade to take care of some of these issues in our kids' education. Thank you. I can't let one parent just bear the burnt of our uh, fifth graders, incoming fifth graders. Uh, so my name is Rachel Reeves. I have an incoming fifth grader. Uh, I wrote a letter last year. I wrote a letter this year. And I feel like we're addressing a similar issue. Uh, and just to sort of reiterate what you've heard already, uh, just the one thing that I would add, which I hope to convey in my letter, is that in addition to the concerns that we had last year, our kids are facing a critical transition going from Pond Cove School to, middle, uh, to the middle school. And so I think it's even more important this year uh, than it was last year to consider what their educational needs are and their learning environment. Thank you. I am Jack Quinn, and I am going into fifth grade. And last year, we had 24 students in our class, and that was a lot. And this year, we had only 20, and it's a lot better now. And I agree with Rachel that going into fifth grade is a big change. So it's more important than last year, this year, to have smaller class sizes. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more comments from the public on agenda items? Thank you so much for coming in to address us this evening. That closes our public comment session. Um, item 5B, um, Administrator's Strategic Plan Updates. Do we have any updates on the strategic plan from our administrators this evening? Oh, we have a winner. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. I was just going to give a, a couple of brief updates on, on um, some things going on. Um, as we're, we're preparing for um, the arrival of, of proficiency-based diplomas and preparing our, our students for that as not only where they are now, but as they transition to the, to the high school, um, we're working on, we are sending um, five staff members, uh, I'm one of them and four others, to um, a standards-based assessment and grading um, seminar um, in mid-May um, in Manchester, New Hampshire, and so we'll be going, and the focus of that seminar uh, talks about the fair and valid means to assess and report student progress. I believe this will help prepare us for our work, um, being able to um, develop a sense of student mastery and student readiness according to standards and put us in a good position to have staff members be able to work with other staff members as we prepare to pilot standards-based grading and reporting uh, um, next year. Um, our, a lot of our efforts and curriculum work that we've been doing of late has been uh, curriculum alignment and articulation in particular content areas. Um, Director Vaughn has been working with us at our school uh, just last week, spent a half day with science teachers and a half day with social studies teachers, science teachers looking at alignment to the next gen, gen standards. We had a recent um, visit for the day from Sean Garrett, who's the high school program leader for science, who worked with us uh, at every grade level and talks with, uh, talked with us about next gen standards and curriculum articulation five to 12, which was extremely helpful and he was a great resource and we're looking forward to ongoing conversations and work 
with Sean. Our social studies teachers spent a half day with Director Vaughn and again looked at articulation of topics and standards uh, across the grade levels um, and getting a real sense of what is going to be covered when and by whom and really trying to articulate exactly who's going to take on responsibility for which standards. So it's, it's important work that needs to be in place before you can report out on uh, proficiency to standards. Uh, our mathematics teams, we've been uh, meeting and in discussion again about curriculum alignment and, and articulation. Um, we've had very recent conversations about um, how we determine readiness and what our readiness criteria are going to be. Um, looking at um, measures of, of mastery and um, looking at what are some of the data points that we already have. Um, do we have enough data gathering measures in place to um, feel as though we're finding, we have a clear sense of student readiness and that we know exactly what the student's needs are so we can prepare them and, and place them for the following year. Um, we're looking at the possibility of, of another assessment um, which is just in the discussion phases right now but it, um, um, a means of looking together at uh, determining algebra readiness and adding that as one of our, our data points um, for, for next year so um, we've, we've had a, a I think a series of very fruitful and, and productive meetings um, as a math team uh, in working towards not only clarity of five to eight standards but really having a, a good clear sense of our process and determining the the readiness not only for algebra but for all our other classes um, I'm excited to report that this Thursday morning we're having an all-school assembly with the kindness guy, Michael Chase. So we got him. He's coming. Uh, our school's very excited. Um, he was there, I believe, with our current eighth grade class. We're fifth graders. And if you just mentioned the kindness guy, teachers and students light up and just say, you know, he's awesome. We're so glad he's coming back. And I guess a common catchphrase that follows from him is students feel really empowered to ask each other, was that kind? And I think that's one of his, his uh, lasting impacts on, on students and teachers. Um, and lastly, I was just going to share out that we did send five staff members to a recent executive function training um, with a, a practitioner named Sarah Ward, who is considered a guru uh, and expert in the area of executive functions. And our teachers are bringing back some learning, and they'll be reporting out uh, to our staff on Thursday afternoon about some of the learning and some of the strategies they've picked up which will really support students in those habits of work that we talk about in execution and uh, managing workflow and organization and paperwork which uh, not in and of themselves determine academic success but we know certainly that they're contributing factors especially at the middle school level so um, we're excited about um, that focus and expertise that some of our staff are developing in executive functions so that was my overview thank you Thank you so much. A lot going on. Good evening. I'm, I promise to be brief. I know that's hard for me, but I promise to be brief. I'm really excited about things to share. Um, I'm going to couple a, um, a couple of things with um, aligning um, and developing our curricula to main learning results standards with the common core standards and next gen standards we are we've been working hard with our student support team um, in looking at how we're going to bridge the achievement gap with our students who who need who need extra support and how that is going to be aligning with common core standards coming up we've just we've just finished the smarter balance assessment <sighs> Um, which, which has gone well, and, uh, but we, we were happy to be the pioneers, and, um, and we know that our middle school and high school comrades are grateful for that. Um, we are in May, we are piloting, not piloting, but um, partnering our teachers with looking at common core standards in math 
in English language arts and in science to lead us in the direction of what's going to inform our summer work and also for next year's, our early release days for, for next year. So we want to get that started sooner than later. We don't, want to, we, we don't want to just make projections on what that work's going to look like. We want to see what we know, what we can find out in May first about that. Um, with regard to uh, technology, I wanted to, we had spoken about having a technology committee created and Tom Chaltray, our tech integrator, Julie Nickerson, our assistant principal and I had a discussion about what made the best sense on putting that team together and we really felt that we, we wanted parents and families to really get a better sense about what does this look like, what's the context for this and so as you know we've had three really successful evenings um, for technology learning with families. We ha in December we had the Coder Express which taught families, which the children taught families how to code and Tom Chaltray went around to each classroom taught them that and then um, in February we had um, grades two through four do Google Apps for education. Students, again, students taught their families all about that. And then um, just last week on uh, March 31st, we had kindergarten and grades one um, do one called Get Appy. And that was teaching um, apps on devices, mostly on iPads. And it was really extraordinary. And we really felt that we gave parents and guardians and families in general a good context for what that means so that we can move forward with developing a committee and seeing everything that we can do to help our children become most responsible citizen, digital citizenships and as well as understand what a, their digital footprint is going to look like moving forward. And Tom Chalter has done a, an extraordinary job doing that so far, but as you know, it, it's ever changing. So we just want to stay ahead of the curve as much as possible. And last but not least, with our connections to, in, in the strategic plan, our, our connections to community, Probably our biggest thing that we've got going right after vacation, it's already underway now, is um, every grade level K through four is doing big project, big project based learning on um, the celebrating the 250th anniversary of Cape Elizabeth and it is just extraordinary. So you'll be getting invitations. Um, uh, we've been generously funded by CIF um, and the Pond Cove Parents Association for a total of over $22,000 for, for, for these projects. And uh, the fourth grade is going to be presenting a um, physical theater performance the, the evening of May 14th, where fourth grade families will be coming, but we'll be having them during the day as well so that everyone can see. And then we're also looking at how we're going to invite community members um, and obviously dignitaries, all the people who have, who have come in and helped us. One of the things I think is really important to know in terms of community and the outreach that's happened is we have had the most extraordinary connections with our town elders, people, people that live in Cape who have come in and spoken to our students. It's been extraordinary. And the students have learned a lot about history. We've gone on bus tours. But one of the things, like, like something, and I wrote it in a newsletter that some of you may have seen, but we had um, wonderful Norm Jordan come and when he spoke about going to school here. And he spoke about one day he was playing marbles out on the playground and um, his, his teacher flung open the window in 1945 and said Germany surrendered. The students just absolutely ate that up. And so it's, it's stories like these that really are helping create these intergenerational relationships with our students and we want that to, we want that to sustain. So it's really the 250 has really given us an opportunity for that. So am I brief enough? Good. Okay. So, but if you have any other questions, obviously I'm happy to answer them. But those are those are just big highlights. And the the 250 right after vacation, um, we have we have artists and residents coming in. We've we've got many that are already underway right now, but we have really really exciting work that we'll be showcasing and um, inviting all of you to, um, and all of you to. So, that's it. So. So I'm also going to just highlight a few things. Uh, first of all, 
I won't go into a lot of detail about curriculum work, but there was be curriculum work being done in all departments to adjust our curriculum to the Common Core, which connects very directly to proficiency-based grading, which is part of the strategic plan. Um, then, um, there are, in terms of goal three, increased student engagement and learning and teacher engagement and instruction, one of the initiatives about strengthening community connections and taking advantage of um, different sort of learning opportunities. Um, we have, I think, doubled or tripled the number of students who are signed up to take online learning courses of one sort or another, particularly AP for All is offering a uh, class in computer programming. Um, so we've had several students, we've maxed out the number that we are allowed to send um, to that program. So kids are really eating that up. Um, there is a first ever sophomore career fair that's being done in cooperation with the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Rotary and South Portland High School, who's had this event for the last several years. Um, so all of our sophomores will be attending that event in May sometime, right? May sometime, May sometime right, okay. I'm writing that date down. Yeah. Um, our seniors are finishing up sort of uh, the paperwork related to their senior transition project where they will all go off for the last two weeks before graduation, working in the community, doing internships, job shadowing, and various things. And I wanted to uh, give a special shout out to um, the High School Parent Association and particularly Trish Brigham and Kim Gillies who have spearheaded our new Flash Chat series, which is a once a month speaker series where someone from the wider community is invited to come in and speak to our students. So we've had, uh, we kicked that off with uh, a man who is a professional circus performer um, and now going to be a professor in a brand new circus college that's opening in on the Portland waterfront, I think on Thompson's Point. Uh, then we went to a, oh, the president of Hancock Lumber who came and spoke about leadership and various aspects of what that all means. Our last presenter was the woman who, or who founded uh, the Holy Donut. Uh, so that was very popular. She also brought lots of donuts um, to share with our students. And next month, um, the week after the break, we actually have um, a runner from the Boston Marathon when, when the bombs went off at the Boston Marathon. And she is going to tell us, share her story with the students with, that she was one of the few who sort of ran in the direction of the bombing to help out the people who were injured. And my understanding is she's quite a, quite a speaker. So I think our kids will really enjoy that. Um, and then I just wanted to feature, I asked um, Stephen Bennett, uh, who was actually a member of the swim team, so he's been up already, um, and Nate Carpenter, the new assistant principal, to talk about an initiative that's going on in both the middle school and the high school, um, training students around to take leadership issues around school climate and how students are treating one another and tolerating one another and that sort of thing. So, Nate Carpenter and Stephen Bennett. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so, I'm not sure how familiar you are with Steve Wessler and his work. Um, we had the luxury as the staff at the high school, six of us, and there were eight middle school staff who spent uh, three amazing days with him and an opportunity to uh, sort of understand his philosophy about how you can better cultures, whether it be in high school or just in, in various cultures. And uh, we spent three days at St. Bart's and we basically went through the various modules and training sessions that he does to sort of communicate with um, everyone in terms of how to change culture. Uh, his, he was a former assistant attorney general in the state of Maine and what he found is a common denominator that uh, throughout his work that all hate crimes send, tend to track back to one specific instance of where language was used of intolerance that just nobody said anything or did anything about and, 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 and attempted to stop. Uh, from happening. So in, in time, those small events led to much bigger events, much bigger events, and much bigger events that ultimately landed on his desk that he would have to prosecute in terms of hate crime legislation. So we took our training uh, to the student body at uh, the end of February. We invited at the high school uh, 20 kids. We had three sessions of 20 kids. We concentrated solely on the sophomore population and junior population initially. We will have our second session in May where we'll look more at the freshman and sophomore population. Um, if you break the half-day activity down that we did, it, more or less 10 different modules, um, interactive, uh, not so much games, but opportunities to share and communicate and sort of, uh, sort of spread and have them understand the message of how they can have a say in changing the culture at Cape Elizabeth High School or anywhere that they come in contact with. 
So I invited Stephen tonight to be part of this simply because he has a personal passion, uh, which is called Peace Jam, and we sort of connected through the process uh, that he has a huge passion for this type of work. So he was invited to be in my session, uh, one of the first sessions. So I thought I'd just let him reflect on the process, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Hello. So uh, before I talk about my Peace Jam initiative, which I've been working on, I started earlier this year. Uh, I was very lucky that Mr. Carpenter invited me to uh, come to one of the Wessler training sessions. Um, everyone that I've talked to who participated in it thought it was great, very eye-opening. There was one activity in particular that we did was we read, well, there was probably, Mr. Carpenter said there was a thick stack of just recollections of just from students from uh, Mr. when Mr. Wessler visited, uh, I believe when I was in my freshman year, of just recollections of stuff that kids have said over the years. And he had everyone get up and read them aloud. And what I heard was just unbelievable, what people said about racism, sexuality, just all that stuff. So that was really eye-opening to everyone in my group. And I really thought that each, from everyone, everyone that I talked to, it went well because especially in my group it felt like everyone was, felt safe, they were able to open up and just talk about everything. It didn't matter in terms of social popularity, where you stood, who you were friends with, it, just, it was just a nice opportunity for everyone to come talk and come together. So, to talk about my Peace Jam initiative. Peace Jam is an international organization started by the 13 Nobel Peace Laureates and the way it, the way it works is each group, there's groups all over the world, each group has to come up with their own way to, like a lot of groups, for example, their own service project, a lot of groups will do something that has to do with water or helping the homeless or just something along the lines of that. So when I came up with my group, I wanted to do something that doesn't se seem like something that hasn't really been done at Cape Elizabeth or in Peace Jam in general. So I thought one thing that's overlooked a lot is bullying. It seems a lot like a lot of, the school over the years has definitely tried some bullying initiatives similar to no, the Wessler Initiative, which I think is working very well in addition to this. I feel that sometimes, though, when it comes from a teacher, it isn't as effective as it coming from a student. So I thought, why don't we try out doing something that has to do with bullying? Luckily, Peace Jam just came out with a curriculum, which is basically it's a big book of activities that you work with students that, and they, they're not necessarily preachy and they don't come out saying bullying is wrong. It's more, it kind of leads them into it through activities. So. Luckily, thanks to uh, Mr. Carpenter and uh, the vice principal of the middle school, Mr. Purley, after April vacation, we are going to be doing a trial run with 12 different classrooms over two days in the middle school with eighth graders. I have uh, organized a team of about 12 kids. We might have a little more, a little less. We'll see. Um, we're going to go in and we're going to run a 25-minute activity and we're going to see how it goes. I know that as the kids get older, sometimes these activities, they don't respond to them as well. But I feel like if we at least implant it in their head and get, get an idea going, then that's a start at least. That's great. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank Very you. impressive. Are there any questions regarding the West of the work for either of us? I think this deserves applause. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Set. Thank you so Thank you much very for that. Much. Thanks. I, I, I just, I'm, I'm a little speechless, but it's just always so rewarding to hear about the incredible, fabulous work that's happening deep within our school system. And we have such dedicated administrators and teachers and passionate students to bring all that work forward. So thank you so much. That's great. Um, on to item 5C, superintendent's report. Okay. So we are, as, as Natalie has pointed out, easing into vacation, coming right up. Um, a reminder to families that there's only a half day of school on Thursday and no school at all on Friday. I know that sometimes gets lost in translation, so. Making notes now. <laughs> there we go. One customer, sir. Um, so. I had the opportunity to attend a meeting. I was invited to uh, meet with a group of parents of students with disabilities a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think it was a very helpful discussion, at least from my point of view, to hear some of the uh, specific concerns and issues. Um, that's a, we um, 
to reach a consensus that we would come back together and um, try to craft a plan for as a new director um, comes on board and director of instructional support, director of special education as is proposed um, in the job descriptions in your packet tonight, but that we would try to sort of get a list of topics together this year. I can hear feedback. I'm all set now, I get the thumbs up. Um, but hopefully be able to identify sort of a list of topics of, sort of mutual interest for training purposes and information sharing purposes as we move forward so that there can be collaborative work for the new director as um, he or she comes on board and um, you know, work with our parents to really work towards the best outcomes for our students with disabilities. So I appreciate um, their time. One of the other pieces that came out of that was a request from parents to have a, more clarity about what our procedures are for people visiting classrooms. So our administrative team started work on that a couple weeks ago and the draft was circulated and I think um, our last administrators sort of shared their feedback on that today. We have an administrative team meeting tomorrow so um, we'll take any final looks at that and then share that out with parents. We have a board policy on visitors to the classroom, but procedures, I think, in, as administrators have shifted, there are some common themes, but I don't think that was ever really shared publicly, so we want to take the opportunity to do that so that everyone knows how that works. It is National Volunteer Week, and we want to just extend our thanks and appreciation to the many, many parents and community members who volunteer in our schools. You heard a little bit from Principal Hassan about the many resources who've come to help us with the 250th anniversary, and as you know, that is just a tiny fraction um, of, of the support that we receive from parents and community members, and, and all of you and board members who volunteer your time as well. So thank you to everyone, and if you haven't picked up your seed packets from your school, they are there just in time for spring planting without snow, we hope. <laughs> uh, there is a... April 1 enrollment report in your packet, just as a FYI, we put those in every month, but April 1 is included, and April 1 is one of the two used for EPS purposes, so just so you have that in EPS. Essential programs and services, which is the funding model that the state uses, so they use an average of our October 1 and our April 1 enrollment in calculating the general purpose aid to the district. Over the weekend, the middle school performed the Wizard of Oz, which is a great Awesome. Um, opportunity, I think there were 60 plus kids involved all total between performers and stage crew members, so congratulations to all of them on a great show and I think they're relieved that production is over and they can catch their breath this week, but thank you to um, Steve Price who puts all of that together and works with the students Just there and time. again with many parent volunteers. Also over the weekend was AuthorFest, when 71 authors and illustrators were at, in the high school gym. Um, and again, a tremendous collaborative effort from largely our um, school librarians or library integration technology specialists across the schools. And a number of authors and illustrators were able to visit the schools over the time leading up and some Skype visits. I would say the highlight for me was um, Friday night's talk given by Ashley Bryan, who is a renowned author, illustrator, artist, storyteller, puppeteer, I'm not sure what he doesn't do, philosopher, um, <laughs> who's 93 years old. Um, he grew up in Harlem, New York during, during the Harlem Renaissance, really in the 20s and 30s, and um, taught at Dartmouth over time, and makes his home on Little Cranberry Island, up off of Bar, in the Bar Harbor area. But he was gracious enough to come and spend an evening talking with all of us about his life and his work and um, reciting poems that um, you know he could recite just about anything to know. If you name a topic, he has a poem to go with it. But he was very inspiring and again, we appreciate the support of many volunteers and the as possible as well as the uh, contributors and sponsors including uh, Bull Moose who is our book sponsor. Summer school, um, some preliminary information has gone out about summer school, so we'll be, I think those letters are scheduled to go home after the April break. I'm getting a nod, so that is, seems to be accurate information, so there'll be more information coming home about that. The fifth and sixth grade music concert was just last week, and there were over 200 students participating out of roughly 280 in the fifth and sixth grade classes. So that says wow. a lot for the strength of our music program in our schools. And again, congratulations to Caitlin Ramsey and Nancy Murray on they do that amazing program. work. Um, and the jazz cabaret, I missed it, but it's always a special event at the high school. And uh, again. <laughs> 
a nice way to sort of see the how our talents grow over time. And Tom Lazat does and a great Tom job. Tom Lazat has done a fabulous job with that program. And he has a lot of other folks who, who help him out with sectionals and, and those pieces as well. Coming up um, in late April is the Municipal Officials Dinner sponsored by the local Chamber of Commerce. So you all should have received invitations to that. It's held at the Pudic. Um, it includes um, South Portland and Cape Elizabeth Municipal and Legislative Officials uh, meeting with <coughs> Chamber of Commerce members and just to discuss hot issues and topics and um, get to know each other a bit. And the Chamber of Commerce, I think Jeff has spoken, mentioned the Cape Elizabeth South Portland Rotary, but I think the Chamber of Commerce is actually helping to sponsor the career fair, though I know there are many Rotarians involved as well um, who are coming to, to represent their um, businesses. We have a lot of concerts coming up in May, and I'm not even going to try to list them all, but before our next meeting, you may want to check the calendar for some of those events coming up. Um, Smarter Balance, as you heard, is pretty much complete at the elementary school. It started with our juniors on Saturday. We had a, a large number of juniors opt out of testing, and that is not unusual. Um, I had the opportunity to, to be at a panel discussion with the new Camden Rockport superintendent, where they had about 33 students left participating in their jun as juniors in Smarter Balance. Uh, I think we had 44, somewhere um, in that vicinity. So. Um, that testing will continue. It wraps up this week with makeup testing for some of our juniors um, who had a little bit to finish up, and then we'll be starting up at the middle school after vacation with grades five, six, seven, and eight. So again, our technology staff, our director of instruction, McVellan, and Noel and his team have worked really hard with our building administrators to try to get all of those logistics together, and our teachers have been um, troopers hanging in through um, some challenges. It has been logistically um, somewhat daunting, and technology doesn't always work exactly as intended, but we've hung in there and um, we're giving that feedback um, pretty consistently and pretty regularly um, to the state about what our experience has been, as I know other districts are as well. So we hope that they'll work out some of the kinks. And again, we won't get information back this year really about performance, um, but the state will use the data that it has to help establish some baseline criteria moving forward. And we had a joint leadership meeting. The school board um, leadership met jointly with the town council leadership to talk about um, sort of shared interests and concerns. One item that came under discussion was a bottle shed committee. So if you may be aware that the bottle shed as it previously functioned is not the same. So the school board needs to appoint a community member to the bottle shed committee. So if you're interested in that, you can contact Chairman Morrissey or contact me and we'll pass your name along to her. Um, essentially that committee will determine, it's a committee of three, um, essentially that committee will determine how to disperse the funds raised by the bottle shed, which is now a clink system as opposed to the manual sorting system that has had been there over time. Again, speak up if you're interested in that. And, and, and to be clear, it's not to sit in the shed and it is, sort no, bottles anymore. No, it is anymore. not. It is it's not. It's a, about how to. It's a committee that will probably meet a couple times a year to decide of the requests from the requests that are received how to allocate the funds right. raised through the bottle shed now clink system. Of course, there's parents everywhere wondering what they're going to do with their Saturday morning. They could sit on the bottle shed committee. They could be on the bottle shed committee, which would be less time consuming and messy. Less messy. Less, less messy. messy. Stick. Um, the, the last two things I'm going to share coming up May, I believe, 8th, and I was trying to look at my calendar. May, nope, sorry, it's May 14th, um, is a book discussion on power and purpose of the teenage brain, which I recommend for adolescents and their parents to read together. It gives you some insights into what's going on neurologically during those years and why you might sometimes be in conflict. Um, date and time? We have a date with time and location? It is uh, November 14th. November. Wow. Fast forward. <laughs> May 14th at 6.30 in the Middle School Library Learning Commons. And I know that that same evening, um, Pond Cove will be sharing some information about uh, the 250th work going on at particular grade levels. So we'll We'll update you on that, or that will be coming home in the Pond Cove newsletter, but there'll be something scheduled that night as well. 
The last thing I want to say is that we are, as you know, hiring for a new director of instructional support, um, an anticipated posting, a new special education director. Um, that posting was put out as an anticipated opening, um, pending the board's adoption of, of the job description and the budget, but that, that posting was put out a couple of weeks ago. Those applications are due in um, during vacation week, so I'll be looking for members of a screening committee. Um, there will be district administrators and district staff invited, obviously, to be part of that committee, but we'll also be looking for um, a couple of parents and a couple of school board members. My anticipated meeting date, first meeting for that committee will be the 29th of April, it's a Wednesday. I'm looking to meet probably at 3.30 to review um, applications and then to set some interviewing dates. So if you're interested in being on that committee, again, please, school board members should let Joe know, but um, parents can certainly contact me and we'll send some more information home about that this week. We did ha also have, which isn't listed separately tonight, but I just want to highlight that um, our high school social worker, Pam Vos, who is previously retired from the district, um, but, but um, has tendered her resignation <coughs> effective at the end of this school year, and we just want to thank her for her years of service. And again, the board will be recognizing retirees at the, their last June. business meeting of the school June. year in June. Just a few things going on. Anything else? Agenda. Thank you for that. It's always interesting to hear what's going on with a deep in the trenches. Um, okay, item six, new business. 6A, may I have a motion on regarding the school board budget for 2015-16? Yes, um, I move that we uh, consider an action to adopt the 2015-2016 school budget and the related revenue components. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion. Uh, yes, as we've uh, said from the outset, um, you know, there's a reason we don't vote on particular departments in the budget or uh, particular areas. It's because we like to wait to get all the information um, so we can assess how uh, the most recent information may impact, um, you know, the final budget we approved. Um, this was a great reminder this year of why we do that. Um, the last budget workshop was Tuesday, March 24th. Um, since that time, we've received an update on uh, medical insurance premiums. Um, medical insurance premiums were projected to increase uh, 5%. Um, and that was a projection. Uh, worst case scenario, we've received our actual uh, health insurance premiums and actually they're projected to decline uh, 2%. So rather than increasing 5%, they are going to decline 2%. Um, we had a short period of time to update uh, the budget. Um, so just so everyone has the same basis. At our last workshop, um, the total expenditures were budgeted to increase 2.1% using the old 5% increase in projected um, insurance premiums and total local property taxes uh, and gross revenue totals was going to increase 1.5%. Um, what we asked the uh, superintendent and business manager to do was to update the budget using uh, our actual insurance premiums. Um, and that was posted to the website as soon as we had that available. So the budget that's before the board um, has lower expenditures and lower property taxes compared to the budget uh, final or tentatively final uh, draft budget at the March 24th. So currently, based on the lower health insurance premiums, school expenditures would increase 1.5%. Total property taxes would increase 0.8%. percent and the question we get asked is, how much will my tax bill go up if I support the budget? That would increase 0.3%. Uh, um, so just so everyone knows, we updated the budget uh, on the website, but um, this is obviously new information um, for the board to consider, um, given the, at the last workshop, uh, it was a higher expenditure and a higher property tax um, uh, uh, amount uh, compared to the the budget that's before the board um, so this is not um, you know typically we look at all the information in workshop format um, but given this is uh, new information um, you know I would offer the board to uh,
discuss it, consider next steps. Um, the net dollar amount, I can't remember if I already mentioned this, but expenditures would be $143,000 below the expenditure amount we discussed at the March 24th workshop. Thank you for that overview. Just, just a point of order that when you ultimately take your vote, you need to have an expenditure and revenue amount as a part of your motion. Okay. So, Michael, the, 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 this pale blue uh, version yes. is the latest version. The yes, the, uh, the 23 million five hundred ninety-seven thousand. Correct. And so, yeah, dated at the bottom right is uh, April 8th, 2015. Um, in response to Meredith's comment about the motion needs to include a, an expenditure and a revenue amount, do, would you like to amend your motion? Uh, no. Um, I didn't make a motion on a budgeted amount because it's open for consideration. I, mean, I, I would be happy to, but uh, the, the, in other words, the final budget numbers or the budget numbers for the March 24th for expenditures and local property tax are different. This is a different, um, this includes health insurance costs that are $143,000. The blue. Bl right. So I so I understand you're asking for a discussion. At, at some point, someone will need to propose a number, and the board can certainly uh, amend that number, but someone will need to propose a number for you to move forward for the vote. I think procedurally, we need a motion with the number. I Correct. suggest we use the one that's here, and if somebody wants to change it, they can make a motion to amend it. OK. That's all right. I didn't want to presume um, which budget numbers to use, so I'll be happy to make um, so the most recent budget would be uh, total school budget expenditures of $23,597,188 and uh, local property taxes of $20,393,459. Second. Second. All those in favor? Well, I'm no, sorry. No. Continue <laughs> discussion. It's getting late in the evening. Um, is there further discussion in regards to um, the amendment around um, the insurance savings in particular? <coughs> Do we want to discuss? Is there, how that is there an amendment? There's not an amendment. No. There's no amendment. I think we should discuss. It's a, it's a motion to approve the new figure. And I do have some proposals, so um, I'll defer to anyone else who has any suggestions or recommendations. I would love to hear from our finance chair what your proposals would be. Sure. Uh, at the uh, March 24th meeting, we were comfortable with the total budget expenditures of $23,740,044 uh, due to uh, lower insurance premiums, we now have $143,000 um, in lower uh, expenditures. Um, I would propose we reinvest uh, that amount back into our, our schools. Um, I think um, looking at all the areas we've discussed, um, one area that we discussed last year and discussed this year is, um, you know, class sizes. Um, so I think, um, you know, as we look at that and I read the class size policy, one of the major areas of considera consideration for me is budgetary constraints. I do think given we have, um, you know, declining enrollment, you know, I had a thought of a certain expenditure number I thought um, we could articulate and justify. Um, so I look at the $143,000 could address one area of the budget. Um, that, you know, based on uh, teacher feedback and based on uh, experience, you know, I think uh, we could reinvest that into um, staff 
um, to address um, two grades that have uh, class sizes that are, yes, they're, it's not a maximum or a min, but are uh, above the recommended size. I have an, another question, which, um, Meredith, did I, um, and you can tell me if this is not the right time to bring it up, but um, did you, did we learn more about preschool from the state? Has the state given us back any information about preschool? The state application came out late last week. We got a notice in last week's commissioner's update, so Wednesday or Thursday of last week, they released um, the application for preschool. Again, given that the time is so late, I think it's difficult for families to make yep. decisions around that, and we don't have a fully fledged proposal because we didn't have an application to respond to. Uh, again, it's my expectation that we will be bringing that forward to you next year. Thank you. I guess I, I bring that up because um, every year our budget, we have surprises, and I know that the work for the preschool um, serves our, the lowest, it serves the cohort. Um, early intervention is the biggest thing we can do to help um, our strategic plans. And so what I heard you say at the last meeting, it's pre this preschool isn't for all of Cape Elizabeth, it is for kids who can't afford um, slots in preschools in the surrounding area, and that would provide us. Um, I just want to be mindful of while we decide the issues that we do this work to prepare the um, district for preschools, but that we don't, is there any way we know we're going forward um, that we can put aside the funds or either have it out of, it wouldn't be contingency, but. Um, are you asking if you can reserve funds in this year's budget for next year? Yeah, summertime because the summer to bring summer school preschools um, programs in. Yeah, I mean you have certainly summer funding available. I don't whether or not we would have. Um, we're not going to be ready this summer, which is what this budget is for, probably to do a preschool program. It would be the subsequent summer. Um, <coughs> it would, it would be unusual to yep. set aside funds in this year's budget for something for an expense that you would not be occurring incurring until the following year. So that would I would not recommend that you do that. Certainly, um, the board has um, an undesignated fund balance. You could be saying, I guess, that monies from that are in the back of your mind to potentially pull forward for use for that next year, but I don't think there's really anything you can do as a body this year to okay. set those funds. Thank you. Question? Please. Um, to, to Michael's point, Meredith, have you had, a, I mean, we put the principles on the spot in the budget workshops about mm -hmm. class size. Have you had any further thoughts or discussions with them about how things are trending, what they're, if they, if they really had their way, what they would think would be our best call on that? Is there any new information? Um, we, we looked at enrollment regularly. The overview narrative said we would be monitoring particular grade levels. Right. I think, you know, K is one of those, certainly. Um, third grade was the other. Um, again, as your enrollment report suggests, um, you know, currently the third grade is above it would be above 22 students per class based on the current numbers. There are 134 students. Um, they were at 132 at the time you received your initial budget proposal. Um, you know, last year the board was clear that it was supporting adding a teacher at the elementary school where class sizes were going to exceed 22. It did not make that same decision for the middle school where classes were exceeding 22. Um, my conversation you know, with our elementary principal is, geez, I'm concerned about the current fourth grade class size. My conversation with the middle school principal is it's not really any different than where we are right now and I'm comfortable with that. That's what I've heard from them. John. So um, I, I guess what I would support doing with access um, insurance <coughs> funds, um, that's the right way to characterize it. Um, th this isn't money that we have. Um, what, I what I would propose that we do is that we reduce the uh, local allocation uh, from taxpayers 
Um, and the reason for that is that um, we have uh, the school boards clearly um, uh, uh, defined a class size uh, target. Um, we have um, uh, that is not defined a, either a cap or a floor on, on class sizes. Uh, if you look back at the data over the last um, eight years or so, um, we've always had um, uh, uh, classrooms um, somewhere in, in, the, in the grades one through um, six range that have had um, numbers of students in excess of, of uh, 20 in, in grades one and two or in excess of 22 in grades um, uh, three through, um, through six. Um, so that's not new. In fact, our class sizes um, are certainly in one to two are trending down. Um, they're also trending down in grades three to six at the, 20, the uh, 2016 projected class size average is 21.6 down from 22.5 this year and, and uh, 22 in 2014. So as our enrollment in, is declining, our class size uh, is also uh, declining. So I think we're, we're seeing a gradual decline in class sizes. We're, we're seeing um, a proposal that's consistent with our class size policy. Um, and then the third thing is that many Many parents in the public debate have cited research that suggests that um, smaller class sizes um, uh, uh, contribute to academic achievement. I, I, it's not clear to me that, um, that nobody's brought forward any research to me that, that um, shows a distinction in terms of academic achievement between a class of 18 on the one hand and a class of 23 on the other. I think that the, what the evidence um, reveals is that uh, it, at the extremes, either at the extremely large class sizes in the neighborhood of 30 or, um, or at the extremely small class sizes that, that um, there can be an impact. But um, when you're in that middling range, um, I, I haven't seen any evidence that suggests uh, impact uh, or differential between um, 18 uh, students and 23. And, and finally, um, even if you do accept an impact for class, a, a class size on, on student achievement, I think it can be said that everything we do has an impact on student achievement. Um, and so to isolate any single variable, I could isolate um, teacher compensation and say that um, schools that better compensate their teachers, um, you know, have better academic results. Or I could isolate, um, I, I could isolate arts education um, or um, world language and, and, and say that schools that, you know, that emphasize these extracurricular uh, get better results. It, in other words, everything that we're, we're doing as a district should be contributing to student, student achievement. Um, and and the, the job of, our job in, 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 in the budget work is to make sure that we're balancing uh, all of those variables for the best possible of results. So, I haven't heard any of our, um, I mean, I, 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 none of our educators have come to us and said that, you know, this is, um, this is necessary. Um, uh, and so um, I'm comfortable with the proposal as it stands. David, are you ready? David? Um, I have a variety of points, but first of all, um, I, I don't think it's accurate to call this some sort of surplus or excess money. Uh, frankly, uh, we made a decision on plugging in a, a, a sum for health expenditures based on it's a must-have. We have to pay it no matter what it was. If it's 5% increase or 2% decrease, we, had, we have to pay it. The fact that we have a little less expenditure on a must-pay item doesn't mean we have any excess money. It simply means that we, we no longer have to pay what we, a, a figure that we must pay, we can now pay at a lower level. We made a decision on class size based on literally, um, and, and based on our policy, it's, it's, it's our class sizes are targets in a policy, and it's whether we exceed or 
or lower than a target is, and that's all it is, is a target, is based on a variety of variables, it's called in a policy, and, it's, and it doesn't include only those. It's, it's, it has to do with a lot of things. It has to do with presence of minorities, uh, presence of kids with disabilities, class mix, uh, quality of education, experience of teachers. There's all kinds of factors that go into this. And the way our policy envisions it, and the way we actually did it was, we have to rely on our school administrators, our principals, and our teachers to tell us, we know these facts, we know these factors, we will tell you when we think we need more teachers, and we'll tell you when we, we think we can handle this classwork. I've asked, and I think other people have asked repeatedly of all the people in the workshop and all the data that's presented to us, we've been told repeatedly, we can handle these class sizes. There will be no need to add teachers beyond that was in the budget in order to achieve the primary two goals of us as a school board. One, to maintain a first class education in this town, but to maintain that by only having expenditures that are reasonably necessary to achieve that goal. We have been told that the only expenditures necessary to achieve that goal are the ones that were in our previous budget. That we do not need to add a couple of teachers. Those class sizes uh, based on the facts we look at make no difference. And looking, and I have done a substantial amount of research on my own, which is always dangerous, and I do have repeatedly asked our administrators and, and various principals and people in other districts as to the relationship between class size and academic performance. And the best studies are all over the place. And the very best studies, the meta studies, basically the two best have concluded there isn't a direct correlation between a class of 25 and a class of 18. Within that bracket, class size does not make a difference. There was a study done in Connecticut by a, a lady named Huxley, which was a natural study. They found no effect on education where, on results as to whether or not the class was 25 or 23. In fact, it was based on students around these grades, from three to fifth grade. So we have no evidence to support that this expenditure is necessary. In fact, if we really had 144 or 143,000 excess money, I would go back to our district team leaders and say, okay, all the other things we can afford as a school district, what's the highest priority? I would be stunned if they said, put in two more teachers. I said, well, why don't you say that in the first place? Because if you had, and we were looking at a 1.5% increase, and you told me it was necessary to achieve our school district, I would have voted to support it. Because that's what my job is. It's not my job to pass on to our voters, to our taxpayers, un fees that are unnecessary, that are not necessary to achieve a first class school district. In fact, if we were to do that, we'd be violating our duty, and frankly, I think we'd lose a lot of credibility with the town council and with our voters. We have gone to them year after year with fairly large increases on the premise that we've uh, stress test all these things, and we are convinced they are necessary for it, for a taught in our school system. We can't say that for these two, for these two teachers Michael was proposing. We have no evidence based on our experts, and no evidence based in all the literature I have read to say that that, that is, that is going to achieve any kind of result. In fact, we have a fifth grade this year, we had 23 students, and they've done a great job. So, it's not excess money, it's not necessary money, and I don't think we should approve it. I think we have to do what John says and, and return to the tax base. So with next year we need a 4% increase. I can look at them with a straight face. I won't be, may not be here next year, but with a straight face, say, just like I told you for the last six years, I'm only coming to you when I think we need it. And I'm going to convince you to vote for it. I could not do that for this, for what John, uh, Michael's suggestion. Suggesting. Thank you. No. I'm just going to add. One piece of clarity, which is again that the contingency funds of $180,000 would cover essentially two teacher positions if we felt that we needed to add those as we monitor enrollment between now and the summer. Um, I'm not, that has been sort of the historical approach that those numbers fluctuate every month. And there's not a degree of certainty. We do our very best with projections, and historically we've been pretty close, but those numbers fluctuate every month over the course of the school year. Um, and so that was why the, our recommendation was to have reserved funds available through contingency to hire teachers if necessary. The only other point I would make is that the board added $10,000 uh, at the last workshop for food service, so your actual fund differential is $132,856 from 
I would say <clears throat> we do we, we don't vote on particular parts of the budget so uh, you know when someone says oh did you approve this or approve that you approve um, you know you look at the entire budget and I agree that it's not like we have quote one hundred and forty three thousand dollars in extra funds to invest uh, or expenditures but I just looked at the total expenditure amount we were comfortable um, with at the final workshop and look at one area um, of need and also look at last year when we had a class size that was projected to be um, 20 over 22 maybe even 23 for fourth grade um, you know uh, we look to keep class sizes at, in grades uh, at Pond Cove um, you know at 22 or, or, or under so um, I agree with Meredith. It's a funny place to be in because I, I am uncomfortable pushing that upper end of 23-24. Unlike um, many of you, I taught third, fourth, and fifth grade here. And Michael actually said to me, what do you think about this number thing? So this isn't somebody's research out of Connecticut. This is me sitting with Cape Elizabeth children and wide-ranging different needs of kids. And I said, my optimum number was 22. And I would feel very comfortable with 22. We're pushing it. We could go below it. You know, it's one of those, it's one of those moments in time where you're trying to make really important calls for kids before all the information's in. So I came into tonight feeling like if our contingency was robust enough that either Mike or Kelly came to us in the summer to Meredith and said, it, you know, we've had five families move in and this is just unprecedented change. On the other hand, it could be five families moved out. This is unprecedented change. So um, I, it, it's hard to say what that trigger exactly is. I've had to manage that in my lifetime. It's, it's difficult, but I really, I'm wondering if maybe, Meredith, you'd feel comfortable if there was a little, maybe a little more in contingency should these issues come up. Um, and, and then I would rest easy knowing that, that uh, the two principals can come forward in July, August, as things change. It's very hard to know in January where the fall, what the fall's gonna look like. And I think we do need to be prepared to protect those reasonable sizes going into next fall. I guess the only thing I would add is um, I, I, I would agree with um, you, Barbara, that the contingencies should take care of this and the trust in the administration to do their, their job um, and to bring it forward through hearing from teachers, um, bring forward what I was, uh, the difference this year that I had from last year's vote was that it, we just had put in the vice principal. Um, we had just reinstated a, a director of instruction. Um, we are just now getting back to the level of staff that we lost six years ago because um, of money issues and uh, tax issues and we've gone through um, bringing our budget to the public to the town council and to the budget and then not approving it so i like so this year i'm happy that we have a full staff i don't think there's another uh, we're working on the the, the volunteer person to extend that job or working on the HR person to extend that job to take uh, the burden off of them. some burden I know that administrators will always have a, a huge burden but uh, to what to round out our um, our staff so that our teachers have the support the other piece of it is if we hire another teacher what we're doing with the if if we have five families that move out what we're doing is we have a teacher that we have to let go. That might be a returning teacher, it might be a, te a long-term sub that it's hard to let people go. So I'd rather have, let Meredith and the administration make that decision um, when they feel the need to instead of voting for it tonight. Barbara, can, can I ask you, were you making a suggestion or were you asking a question about is there enough in the contingency fund? Are we I, was, I was raising the possibility of, 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 of getting Meredith's take on would she be more comfortable with, with a slightly higher contingency and would we maybe want to direct some of this funding there. 180000 is 
it can can be hit pretty quickly depending on different. But so I was just going to ask you. So the experience this year, a forty thousand dollar hit as an example with the mold mitigation that right. we needed to deal with um, right. in the basement, that would have left us stretch to try right. to fund two teachers. Our right. ballpark for a teacher with benefits is about $75,000. Mm -hmm. So 150 is essentially enough to cover mm -hmm. two positions with mm -hmm. a limited amount left yeah. over if you need to add that. So if you want there to be enough available in contingency to potentially impact a third position, it would be adding at least another $45,000 okay. um, to contingency. Okay. Um, so my concern about changing the makeup of fifth grade class size at this stage of our deliberations is the transparency issue. We have spent months um, supporting and, and, and relying on our current um, policy IID, which states clearly that those are guidelines and those are not a ceiling or a floor on the number of students, but a recommended, recommended class size. Um, I have trust in the teachers and administrators who have brought their budget proposals forward to us and as David eloquently pointed out, passed the stress test of questioning from the board about what the administrators and teachers who are really the um, eyeballs on the ground for what they need to propose to us. I also trust our administrators and our teachers as summer draws near and next fall comes closer, if they, we could maybe move enough money of the um, insurance differential into the undesignated fund balance or contingency wherever it would belong, so that should those needs over the summer show that there's um, something that isn't quite right in the third grade or the fifth grade or even the incoming kindergarten, because there's a number of avenues here instead of just the one fifth grade to allow our administrators and our teachers who are professionals and experts and know which of those students need what supports um, to put that funding aside with the transparency knowing that this has been the debate now and trusting in the process that should our students needs prove that they need another teacher let the administrators make that decision in the summer when we do know more about whether we've lost five families or gained five yeah, I'm not, sorry. I'm not sure, but I guess I'm, I was following you to the very end. Are you saying that you would um, increase our contingency? You would support increasing our contingency? I would support increasing our contingency with this money. Uh, again, I will have to say, as far as I'm concerned, there's been no change in fact in terms of what all of our evidence was when we had all this and we repeatedly asked these people. There's no change in fact I'm in terms of... I'm not saying there's a change in fact now. I'm saying that there could be a change in fact later in allowing those decisions to be made. Okay, I, my, point, my point still stands. There's no change in fact as to whether or not it's a reasonable risk to have an $180,000 contingency. And what we determined that the only change in fact that's occurred is we have less of an expense than we uh, must have than, than what we had before. I. As far, and I think Meredith already said this, and I don't, I don't think it's Meredith's, no disrespect Meredith, but it's more our call at this point. I've not heard a thing from anybody that our risk level on enrollment has gone up any more than it did three, four weeks ago. In which case, I don't see any legitimate reason to put $140,000 in, into our, make our contingency now, I might stink on that, 320000 something like that, uh, versus 180000 there is no need, and quite frankly, given the overwhelming comments we received, we appear to not be basing our, our decision based on fact, but rather on emotion. I mean, I just think we have to make, our, we, we're paid the big bucks to make the tough decisions of balancing costs and needs. I have heard no... I think you've misunderstood my proposal. Okay. I'm proposing that we put enough in contingency to have a contingency plan in place should enrollment over the summer prove that our class size guidelines are going to be drastically exceeded. I, 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 understood, I understood that when you explained it. Now, yeah. but what you are proposing is a change. You're increasing our contingency from 180 to 320, right? Well, we could do that in a couple of different ways. One of them is to just not use as much contingency fund to fund this year's budget. 
We're not using any of that contingency money to fund this year's budget. I'm confused. Mm -hmm. Or undesignated fund balance. Undesignated fund balance is a different source. So, so again, you're talking about an expenditure increase. And mm -hmm. uh, if you add to contingency, it's an increase in our expenditures. If you adjust the undesignated fund balance, you're adjusting the revenue component of the budget. But then moving forward in the future, if our contingency funds aren't used, do they get put into the undesignated fund balance? They return to the undesignated fund balance at the end of the year. All unused okay. funds from our budget go back to the undesignated fund balance at the end of the fiscal year. Okay. I would just like to comment. We do have new information. If you read the, the guidelines, and we've all said they're guidelines, we never voted on class sizes. One of the main items is it says to consider our budget constraints. So to say we don't have new information is, is not factually correct. We do have new information. So given our guidelines are purely that guidelines, it doesn't say a maximum, it doesn't say a minimum. Certainly a school board member that says, oh, our expenditures are going to be 140000 less than what we thought, that is a material change. And the guideline, it says, something to consider our budgetary constraints. Well, then that should have been considered when we were voting on the need for that particular. I'm sorry. Yeah. I I'm responding. He's no, I'm, I'm just saying that, that is, it is. So I, I'm, I under, I, I'm happy uh, if, um, you know, that the preference is to wait. Um, I do think as uh, this is the second year we've had this uh, discussion. And, um, you know, if, if we want to use the contingency and wait for more information and make adjustments before the year, if that's how the board chooses to proceed, um, that's the board decision. I would encourage us to um, revisit the policy. Um, if we choose to, the, the way it's currently written is best serves administrators, teachers, students, and parents going forward, so be it. Um, but I think um, to say that it's an emotional decision, it, it's not. We have new information, um, and you know, one option is to stick with the expenditure amount we were comfortable with uh, two weeks ago, and say, okay, how could that expenditure be reallocated? So um, I'm I'm happy to to amend my motion, and um, uh, you know. We can stick with what the board's will is, but I think it was important to have that conversation and just to highlight that the policy says many things that their guidelines, but it also says take into account budgetary constraints. The board did not vote on class sizes during the workshop. Um, so I, I would be comfortable, um, because we're talking about a couple of different proposals that are on the table with um, Barbara's proposal, if I may call it that, to increase contingency funding by, I think, the, by the figure Meredith mentioned of $45,000 in order to be, in order to have some, some protection against um, un, unknown enrollment issues. However, I would want to be very clear that, that class size is appropriately a board policy issue. So while we look to administrators for guidance around around class size, I don't want to, uh, I want to uh, be fully um, aware of our responsibility to, to, um, to create and stick to class size policy. And so I don't want to put that responsibility onto administrators. It's, a, it's, a, it's our policy and we, you know, we need to own it. So I'm comfortable um, that the, there's no proposal on the table that's inconsistent with our class size policy. Um, and, and, but I, I know that if, uh, so I, what I imagine is if, if in August there was changes in enrollment, administrators had concerns, that they would come to us and say, uh, you know, so we've, got a, we've got classrooms that might have 24 in them now that we thought we thought were going to be 23. So we know you have a target. We know that you don't have a, a range. So we want to know, you know, where is the, where, how does the board come out on you know, on that. Um, I don't want to put that, you know, on administrators so that we're abdicating our responsibility to, to, to produce class size policy. 
I would agree with what John says in the sense that it is our decision. If you look at the policy, that if the load exceeds it, all the superintendent does is speak to the building administrators as to that, is this a problem or is this not a problem? And then when I look at this policy taken as a whole, that they then come to us in terms of whether or not, if, if she makes a recommendation after consulting with the board the superintendent as to whether or not to add a teacher or two. I, I would take issue respectfully, Michael, with your comment that there, that there is a change in fact. There is no change in fact in the viable thing, which is whether or not we need these teachers. Nobody raised it as an issue, no administrator, no teacher. We were told we were comfortable with 23 or whatever it happens to be. The only change has been, you are correct in stating that we have a lesser expense. I don't think that's what you mean by budgetary constraint within this guideline. That's the whether or not once you've exceeded it, then you make a decision based on first taking into consideration budgetary constraints. We took, I guess what I'm saying is I disagree with you. That the way we attempted to do this, if people wanted something, we would then vote at that time, do we need it and what's its balance against the budgetary need? Nobody has raised that. So that's why I'm saying it's, it, it, it is, um, uh, the only change in fact has to do with expenditure, not whether or not we need it. So I, I say on this decision, there's not a, there hasn't been a change in fact. The only change has been on an absolute expenditure we have to pay, <coughs> which we now no longer have to pay as much. I see your point, but I, I just... Sure, no, that's, uh, it, they're good discussions to have, and I think they uh, highlight some uh, opportunities before the next budget season to, uh, um, you know, revisit the policy, and um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, so... Um, <laughs> so you either need to vote... The motion or amend the motion? If there's I, I uh, will amend the motion. Um, I don't have a calculator, so this might be. Uh, thank you. Our finance chair can't do it. You said. Oh, he can. I like your point. Uh, Forty-five thousand. Forty-five. What did you say you needed to get comfortable with? Each teacher position, again, that's a rough number, is 75000 That's a master's seven level teacher with full benefits. So three teachers would be 225 We currently have 180 in contingency. All right. That's my motion, so I can decide, I guess. So to move 45000 from the savings and insurance into the contingency funds, so that should need be. No, you just change the figure. There's at least two teacher. Three. Well, I'm hoping not to use all three in case something blows up or. But if we, uh, but if we did use three, we would still have 45000 left over. Is that right? No. 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 If you needed to fund three teacher positions, it would, it would cost two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. And if you added forty-five thousand, that would leave you with no additional money. However, Michael phrases, if he's going to do it, he needs to raise the amount by 45000 And our contingency, we're not designated at this point for any particular purpose. People have to understand that. And there could be some other more immediate need. That is All right. I mean, so the uh, if we add fifty thousand, so everyone understands if we add fifty thousand dollars to contingency that uh, increases. Did you say fifty? I, I did fifty. Uh, it increases expenses fifty thousand dollars or expenditures and local property taxes by a similar amount. So the bud the uh, amended motion would read as such, I move that we adopt the 2015-2016 school board budget and the related revenue components. Expenditures would be $23,647,188 uh, and local property taxes of $20,443,459.
What, what was that amount, Michael? Twenty million. Twenty million four hundred forty-three thousand four hundred fifty-nine dollars. Was it 453? 443. 20 million, 443, 459 in local property. And we can update, well, I guess we should vote first. Well, can I ask a really silly question? Yes, please. Um, if we're moving $50,000 into the contingency fund, which then ex it increases our expenditures, what happens to the other eighty thousand? It goes back. We goes back to the taxpayer. We don't have this money. We don't, yet. We don't raise the funds to appropriate that. So, so that's but already local, not included in here. Okay. So the, in the blue paper here, it says the local property tax is twenty million three hundred ninety-three thousand four hundred fifty-nine. But Correct. if it's going back to the taxpayer, we're, no. We're adding, no. We're adding fifty thousand to that. It's not in here. It's not in here. Don't. It might be closer to a one percent. I would say it's, that is Nothing's accurate. going back to the taxpayer. <coughs> we're talking about taking from, we're Asking taking a little less. For we're just taking a little less. So, um, My high school math teacher is cringing. Does everyone understand the amended proposal or motion? Yes. Do you like clarity about what the impact of that $50,000 is on the tax rate? Uh, well, sure. Seven cents. So it goes from four cents to seven cents, so it's a three cent increase. I'm sorry. I can't plug this in here. From sixteen eighty to what? what? Yeah, I, so I see I'm changing. $12.19. So what's our... In so we're going from $12.19, which was last year's school portion of the tax bill, of $12.19, to $12.26. I'm sorry, we have twelve fifty six in here now. Yeah, David, that's a dollar amount, not a tax rate. It would increase twelve dollars and fifty six cents. That's not a that's not a mill rate. Well it just happens. It's helpful if somebody could tell me the changes for each one of those numbers so I could follow it. Yeah, so the four cents would go to seven cents. Right. And that would go to twenty one ninety eight. What would go to twenty one ninety eight? The twelve fifty six was the previous proposal before I know. this I, discussion. This is real simple. Don't just throw a figure at me. Tell me how each one of these figures changes. Is the best way to do that it. That is twelve fifty six. What does that change to now? If that's in the blue paper. What does twelve dollars and fifty six cents change to? Just pulling it up. We were at we were at twelve dollars and nineteen cents last year. All right, I don't care about that. So what's on their paper is not correct. It said twelve dollars and fifty six. That's what's confusing us. Those are the dollars. There's a the mill rate. Yeah, ignore the twelve fifty six. They happen to be close numbers. Yes. Is that medium home? Right. So do, does everyone have what they need? No. So I still maybe, don't have a figure. Maybe we can just read this this last paragraph out loud with the new numbers in it. That would be Starting helpful. with on a median home of three hundred fourteen thousand, <coughs> projected property taxes for education would increase by. I assume it's more than twelve dollars and fifty six cents. Maybe it's twelve dollars and fifty seven cents. I don't care what it is. Right. It'd be well. I think you said twenty one dollars, twenty one dollars and ninety eight cents. Seven cents. An increase of seven cents per thousand dollar valuation. We're getting there, David. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to give our business administrator an opportunity to give you the number, and he can come up and repeat that maybe at the microphone. Yeah. And I'm cross checking it simultaneously. 
So if you're on your tax sheet, the median home of 314000 the uh, property taxes for education would increase $21.98 based on your current proposal. And that would be $0.07 cents per $1,000 of valuation. And it would be a 6% increase. 6%? Point, 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 point 0.6. Point 0.6. Point 0.6. Sorry. That's That's just point six. 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 Point the motion was proposed by Michael. I would support Michael's and John's proposal. I've always been in favor of increasing contingency funds to cover for a lot of things. So I have no problem increasing the contingency fund by a modest amount because it, if it helps, we need a teacher, then we get a teacher. If we need something else, we get something else. I've always advocated for slightly higher contingency than we ended up with. So I'm happy with that. Any further discussion on the budget? Are we ready to vote? All those in favor of Michael's amended motion? Seven. Seven. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there with us. Item 6B, may I have a motion in regards to the community services budget? I move that we um, approve the 2015-2016 community service budget and the related revenue components. May I have a second? A second? Discussion? So once again, you need the dollar amount. Oh. Oh, so sorry. Yes. Where, where is it all? Um, I will read it to you. Thank you. It's coming from your summary page. I can circle the numbers. It's okay. Michael's going to make the motion. Yep. I move uh, that we adopt the 2015-2016 community services budget uh, and related revenue components uh, total expenditure budget of one million seven hundred ninety eight thousand one hundred thirty nine dollars and total local appropriation of five hundred twenty three thousand uh, seven hundred and ninety dollars second no I'm, I'm hearing comments from the Russell has his hand Russell has his hand I'm, I'm, I'm looking right at him. Russell, would you care to? I want a clarification where you came up with the 523,790. I have exactly $10,000 off. My number is 533,790. Uh, Page four of the summary sheet that was provided. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have that. This is this was my original budget. Three, three twenty. Mm -hmm. misses. Mm -hmm. The fitness center. The fitness center is not in this. That which is the discussion we had. It should be one ninety three plus ten plus ten. That should be two thirteen. Do we need to take a minute for, for you to compare notes with our business administrator? Yes, I guess so. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, 
move on to the next agenda item while we do some high finance in the gallery. Uh, may I have a motion on item 6C, um, consideration to approve revisions to the 2015-2016 academic calendar? Yes, I move that we approve the revisions to the 2015-2016 academic calendar. Bit of a second. second. Discussion, please. So, <laughs> one of my favorite topics. So as we all know, we've had multiple discussions about calendar, and you may have read recently that Portland moved its start date back to before Labor Day. Um, Portland has, though, 178 student days in its calendar. Cape Elizabeth has 175. So Portland's moving that date back doesn't really impact our alignment with the PATH calendar with the seven sending districts. So while they can move that start date back, it doesn't allow us to move that start date back because the seven districts still have to be in alignment for the 170 of those 175 instructional days. Um, two of our other neighboring districts, Cumberland and Falmouth, also have additional student instructional days, and so they also have since moved their start date back to before Labor Day. Again, because we don't have the additional instructional days, we can't make that move without having the districts exceed the five, the limit of the five dissimilar days, days. Dis dissimilar instructional days. And is that because they end later as well? Oh, they end in the same in June. They do because they have a the longer days. school year. Um, so, so there are four districts, including us, who have 175 instructional days: South Portland, Gray New Gloucester, Yarmouth, and I don't know who I'm missing. Scarborough. I guess, and so, and uh, correct, oh, and us, and Cape Elizabeth, <laughs> that's four. Um, so our four districts have 175 days. As it is, there are five days in our shared calendars that do not align between workshops, vacations, teacher professional development. Some of those are dictated in some districts by collective bargaining agreement. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is, while it instructionally would be helpful to have our school year start before Labor Day, we don't have that flexibility. What Senator Millett um, alluded to earlier was that there had been testimony before the legislature. There was a bill recommending that districts with seven or more sending districts, such as Paz, our local district, be given seven dissimilar calendar days. And the Education Committee voted ought not to pass on that particular bit of legislation, despite some efforts from local superintendents just to make it easy. adjust that. So, we are where we are, and our first day of school in the proposed calendar remains September 8th. So in essence, our end dates are all anchored together, and what's floating between all the other districts is their starting date. Yeah, the one other point I would make, even though Portland is starting earlier, for our students who do attend PAS, the first day of PAS is actually September 8th, so there is not an impact to our local students in the start of their school year with PAS. That's good. I just want to mention that I, I uh, wrote to her about this because I know it's been such a quandary and I just appreciate, I want to say I appreciated the efforts to try to push the legislature to, to be a little more flexible with this really different catch-all catch path school because we have very different ways we like to run our things. So thank you for the efforts in any event. We were certainly disappointed by the outcome. Yeah, but. right. Is there any further discussion on the calendar? Okay. Um, I guess I have one, Meredith. Um, with our half days uh, for Pond Cove, did you tell me, that, or did, did we uh, realize that Pond Cove and middle school had the same amount of planning time with these half days overall? So on the bottom of it says the high school has 11, uh, the teachers. What I'm looking for is that so, with has so it created absolute equity in planning time? No. Okay. But what has it created by the half day? It schedule? has created an additional roughly 15 hours of planning time for Pond Cove teachers. And middle school teachers do have time, more time, uh, a period within their day? Our middle and high school teachers each have two periods within their school day one of which is used for a team meeting and that looks a little bit different in, in those two buildings and the other of which is used for planning time. can be used individually but there's flexibility um, in that. Um, Pond Cove teachers this year and they're in a six day rotation so that 
is slightly different, but um, next year they'll be in a five-day rotation again, I believe. Um, they haven't finalized their schedule, but have the capacity to do that, but that means that there's a daily single planning period. Again, teachers there also have a daily recess, but they have duty right, half of the, that time, right, half right. of that time, okay. essentially. Thank you. Makes sense. Good question. Any further discussion on the calendar? Okay. All those in favor? Seven. Thank you. Um, excellent. Are we ready to circle back to the speak? Okay. Uh, Michael, would so you Russell, care to... The senior discount or the fitness center? It's one of the two. I'm not sure which it is, but it's one of the two. Uh, I think Michael needs to finish making a motion, or at least remake the motion uh, so we're clear. So, uh, is it the, is, uh, are the, um, is the local appropriation should be 533790? Correct. And is, is the extent expenditure total? Absolutely correct. correct. 1798139. So it should be 533790? Yes. Okay. New motion. Uh, I move that we adopt the 2015-16 community <laughs> services budget and related revenue components, expenditures of $1,798,139, and total local appropriations of $533,790. Uh, $533, Second. Second. Kate. Discussion? I'm glad we had the here. <laughs> I'm very glad we have the director here. Uh, I think that um, Russell has done an amazing job at being a very clear and concise and easy to follow budget, as evidenced by the lack of questions or discussion at this juncture. So I think we're ready to vote. All those in favor? So, thank you. Thank you, Russell. May I just ask, because I missed who seconded the motion on the calendar? There were seven? I know who put the vote was, but I don't know who seconded it. Um, I did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. Do you want to play back the tape? No. Nope. We'll be able we, to we later. Have it. It's not a critical <laughs> matter, but Kate and Suzanne, thank you. Item 16, may I have a motion in regards to the job descriptions? I move that we can uh, approve the following job descriptions. College Counselor, Volunteer Extended Learning Opportunities, Coordinator, Director of Special Education, Director of Instruction. Second. I second. Thank you. Sorry. Discussion? So I'll just point out that all of these job descriptions were raised. Um, the College Counselor one was put in your packet last month, again, as part of a review when we have openings. We review our job descriptions. We had the retirement um, that we announced to Belinda Snell, Snell, so we had shared with you um, the draft College Counselor job description. The other three positions were discussed at budget workshops as a part of that process and were included in the budget packet. So just to review, as I understand it, the Director of Instruction, Ruth Allen Vaughn's description, is being expanded to include EAL and Gifted and Talented, mm -hmm. um, and that the Director of Special Education has been realigned to more closely do um, evaluative work at the building level. Well, it's essentially been reduced to focus specifically on special education and removing some of those other responsibilities. So it includes the removal of English language learners, ELL, of gifted and talented, and um, of the Title IX Title of Action right. Coordinator role. Um, and then also just wanted to echo that the Director of Special Education and the Director of Instruction are currently in the bargaining unit, and the bargaining unit has been informed of these changes. Do I have that correct? Yep. Part of the, they're part of the administrative working. Um, and that we're not adding any positions with the college counselor or the volunteer extended learning opportunities. We just have some retirements in those regards and we're taking the opportunity to align those positions so that we can more closely serve the needs and the goals of our strategic plan. And I'm particularly excited to um, see the expanded opportunity for our students who are looking for volunteer opportunities um, with the expanded 
job description of the volunteer and extended learning opportunities. I really thank all of those who put their heads together and put that together. Um, any other discussion? Isn't actually the volunteer extended learning opportunities position, isn't that an expansion of that position? It is an expansion. It's an expansion. Not a new position. It's not a new position. Okay. But it's a lot, it's... Did it we expand is, from a 0.5 to a F1 of it, We've it? gone from 0.75 right. to a, a 1.0 FTE, and it is a change in the responsibilities for right. So it's not a new position, but it's a lot... It's a slightly expanded... It's an expanded position. position, not just in terms of job responsibilities, but in terms of budget impact as well. Correct. Thank you. Meredith, um, I... I should, I probably should know this, but what does in the volunteer ELO coordinated job description on page two, CPT, what does that stand for? People is with CPT? Yeah. yeah, it's right here. Um, it's interface with key personnel and teams such as the CPT and special ed. Would be curriculum planning teams. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we shouldn't have acronyms That's in our right. job I, description. I knew it was a good one, but I just um, didn't recognize it. Any further discussion on these job position descriptions? All those in favor? Seven. Item 16, may I have a motion? I move that we approve the high school VEX robotics team trip to the VEX World Championship in Louisville, Kentucky, April 15th to 18th, 2015. Second. Second. Okay. Discussion? So we have known this was coming since they <laughs> championship. Um, unfortunately, there's usually a pretty limited window uh, in which we turn these around, and they will be going to Louisville. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> I'm glad we get to vote tonight. I am as well. <laughs> Things happen fast. Yes, really. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor so they can pack? Thank you. Seven. May I have a motion on 6F? I move that we approve the following athletic curricular staff nominations in the high school of Kevin Stilton for Lacrosse Girls JV and Kurt Chapin for Lacrosse Girls Assistant. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Second. Thank you. Item 6G. Yeah. Yes, I move that we approve uh, the following policies for second read, uh, JFABB, JFABD, JFL, and JFL-E, um, all of which are in your, uh, and their changes are in your packet. Second. Second. Okay. Discussion? Uh, just in terms of the changes, they're mostly cha small changes uh, in terms of these policies in order to comply with the law. Uh, no, there's no particular changes I want to bring to the board's attention, aside from your study of the changes already that you've done in preparation for this meeting. The tiny thing, but would you mind reading those just so the listening public knows the policy names we're dealing with? Reading with which? Just the title of it. Um, I'm sorry, sure. The um, JFABB is the, um, the International Exchange Student Program Policy. JFABD is the Education of Homeless Students. JFL is Reporting Child Abuse and Neglect. And JFLE is Suspected Child Abuse and Neglect Report Form. JLF. And I was Sorry, that's my so dyslexia. Yeah, I'm going to say someone's looking for John. It's Jane. Got you. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of these policies? Thank you. Um, would you like to read off the consideration for 6H? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the policy uh, 
before the board for first reading is JID, uh, Students of Legal Age. And um, that policy, the, the policy committee is proposing no changes to. And if the public, after reviewing this policy, has any questions, they should direct them to you as the policy chair or to Meredith, the superintendent. Either one is appropriate. Thank you. Yeah, our next policy committee meeting would be, uh, May, would be May. May 26th. May 26th. Uh, sorry, yes, May 26th. May 26th. Okay. So you would probably like them before the, a couple days ahead of time, should there be any. Prior to the Memorial Day weekend. That's perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for all your work in that committee. Uh, may I have a motion on 6I, representatives to the Community Services Advisory Committee? I move that we appoint uh, representatives Joe Whalen and Tara Sinopoulos to the Community Service Advisory Commission for a three-year term to expire December 2017. Second. Thank you. Discussion? I just want to thank um, the community members for standing up um, for that committee. It's an exciting committee. It is an exciting yes, committee. It's exciting work. Here it is. Um, all those in favor? Seven. Item 6J. I move that we consider, um, I'm sorry, I move that we approve an unpaid leave of absence for a middle school teacher during the 2014-2015 school year. We Second. need to insert a name in that? Yes, it's Elizabeth Johnston. Elizabeth Johnston. Second. Second. Discussion? So I'll just remind the board um, that, that your collective bargaining agreement it says teachers shall be granted a leave of absence for up to one year following the birth or adoption of a child. So this request is consistent with that policy. The teacher originally requested a 12 weeks of family medical leave. Um, and this is requesting to extend that leave through the remainder of the school year. Um, it is a position, it is a uh, essentially a literacy strategist position within the middle school, literacy and mathematics strategist, so that the person is doing sort of teacher coaching as well as um, some student intervention and support and the middle school is unable to, to locate a replacement for that position and the teacher went on leave this year. It's a difficult, coaching roles are difficult positions to fill in a short period of time because a lot of coaching work relies on um, relationships that you've developed. And so her leave of absence request falls inside of that one year? It does, yes. Far within, okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Seven. <laughs> seven, okay, thank you. Um, item seven, moving right along, committee reports. Are there any committees that have reports to? Well, uh, policy committee was spent some has been spending some time um, uh, discussing policies related to uh, search of students, um, and um, particularly we've been working to make those policies consistent with our policy in terms of our school district relationship with law enforcement authorities. Um, uh, as such, there are some issues which we think that probably deserve the attention of the full board before the policy committee does our sort of wordsmithing of the policy because um, those issues um, you know, I think we, we want to have a sense of where the, board, where the board wants to go generally around those issues before we make uh, changes to existing policy. So um, as you and I discussed, Joe, that may be an opportunity for the board to discuss that in a workshop format. I don't know whether we have that availability on our schedule, but, mm -hmm. uh, and it could be um, you know, a time when we, the board invited, um, not only the public, but um, representatives of law enforcement to, to participate in that discussion as well. 
I think that would be a fruitful discussion. So I'm seeing that we have two more regularly scheduled workshop and finance committee meetings coming up, one on April 28th, where we have a slotted topic for proficiency-based diplomas. And then on May 26th, another workshop, and the slated topic there is the strategic plan goals update. I'm wondering if there's room on either of those agendas to include search policy discussion? We probably don't need a lot of time. Maybe but I think we can, that's certainly yeah. a discussion that we can have. So maybe, yeah, okay. maybe what we'll do is we'll take that into consideration okay. on an upcoming workshop. Do you have a timeline in which you would like to? Well, we, 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 what we might do is change our policy committee meeting agenda for May uh, if we were going to decide to address this at a workshop, at a later workshop. Okay. We so, would probably take up something else for a for the time being and then get back to There's plenty of policies to go through. There's no shortage of policies <laughs> to explore. Excellent. Okay. So we'll um, take that under advisement for an agenda for a workshop. It's a good idea, if I do say so myself. And, and, and the other, only other thing I would mention is, Michael, in the course of the budget conversation, Michael mentioned that you know a review of the, the class size policy uh, is in order. I, I, um, in, in, in that it might uh, help uh, produce more clarity around around that, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's something uh, that I would be happy to a conversation. I'd be happy to take up in the in the policy committee. I think it's you know best for us to do in advance of the of next year's budget season, mm -hmm. obviously, um, and you know, so maybe that's a something that we would look at uh, in the fall. I think finding a sweet spot between having enough breathing room in the current emotional response in the current budget season, and yet in enough time so that we can review and adopt and make that proper review of that before we go into the next budget season. So uh, it's a good idea. Timing is everything. Um, good luck. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, I know that we have a number of committee appointments and as well as advisory positions. Do we have any other updates? Share that um, I attended the last uh, CIF meeting and was interested to hear that they're getting ready to roll out or perhaps have already a survey of high school students. And the whole series of questions that I thought were, were pretty interesting about how did you first hear about the foundation? Uh, are you aware of what it does, their primary goals? I think they're looking for visibility <coughs> and understanding even among students about the workings of the foundation. Uh, where should the funds go? What would be your ideas, et cetera? How do we get alumni interested in donating? So, um, and, and so they're going to be working on that and thinking about you know, a Facebook spot, how can we get better uh, visibility among the student body, which I thought was an interesting strategy. And in addition, they're thinking about doing uh, how they want to proceed forward doing larger grants that really have significant impact uh, over time. So they're, uh, and they've got quite a bit of uh, change in their board coming up as well. So it was, I was glad I got to the meeting with the folks who are there now, and I'll keep up with them the best I can. Um, and on the and on the legislative end, uh, I'm still a little a little unsure how I should proceed. If, how uh, how aggressively I'm supposed to be approaching all of you with things that are that are being watched by MSMA, or if you want to have Meredith trigger me, like I, I'm feeling badly I didn't write about the seven day extension. I would have been happy to write about that strongly. Probably wouldn't have made a, it. Was being it being a difference. Sounds like it wouldn't have mattered. Wouldn't have mattered. So I will I will go on vacation guilt-free, <laughs> but they are, um, the MSMA is watching carefully uh, what came out with unanimous support about the professional evaluation, professional growth system to be submitted with the extra year, and a second bill, LD74, to not use the MEAs for teacher performance prior to the school year 17-18, which 
only makes sense. Do you have any idea where that stands in the committee work I, now? I don't. Um, I know um, Suzanne Godin mm -hmm. was at the legislature all day today. Okay. Um, as of Friday, there was no update on that when the conversation okay. superintendents met with Connie. I'm trying to go online as much as I can to see what's going to hearing, and I know Suzanne's representing Cumberland County superintendents, but um, please let her know that if there's ever, ever a time or I'll, I'll email her myself, that she felt it would be helpful to hear from Cape Elizabeth. I'm happy to Absolutely. write. Um, they're also watching the, uh, that act to restore local control, the opt-out bill from the Common Core. I think we've heard a little bit tonight that it was um, not a huge issue in some grades and larger at the high school. That will be one to follow. That would require districts to uh, assertively say to parents, you may opt out versus versus uh, them coming upon that knowledge themselves and making the opt-out request. So that'll be an interesting one to pay attention to. There's several about vaccination philosophically, um, about discussing ahead of time with pediatricians. You must vaccinate. You never can make you vaccinate. I mean, it's all over the place. And uh, to me, that's something that would require our nurses to really, and our, and our school physician to advise us if, if we ever wished to take a, a stand on that and come to some sort of agreement. The high school start times were mentioned, and then uh, LD464 uh, is really trying to get those next generation science standards adopted. That's been a foot dragging uh, situation up in, the, up in Augusta, and it's put all of us working on curriculum kind of in a I mean, we, we think it's coming, but we're not sure it's coming, so I think that one deserves perhaps some support. Well, there, yeah, I think the governor has been pretty clear that right. it's not something that he supports, so, um, but I know from speaking, yeah. curriculum leaders are saying very strongly that they do. Exactly, it, so. and Anita Bernhardt has explained to me she'd like to bring it forward when she feels it would be passed. Yeah. But I think it's become the de facto science curriculum in this, for the state. And then finally, LD557, there's going to be a lot of work on how to figure out if students um, have medical marijuana prescriptions, uh, how they would be administered in school in non-smokable form, et cetera. There'll be a lot of conversation about that. We'll just keep a close eye on things. Yeah, our, nurses next, our next meeting of nurses and school physician is Monday, May 4th. Oh, great. And so those are two items for discussion, great. though. Yeah. There may not be much further information with that. Right. That's it. I'd just like to say that the Innovation Committee panel, I'm not sure what to call it, committee, um, is working harder at trying to hone um, our direction and our, our, not necessarily our, our mission, but more like who we are, represent our, what we're aiming for, how we're different from um, C, for example, we're getting ready to actually um, submit a, a grant request to C, um, which you know we'll have more to share with that um, in late May, I believe. Um, but it's it's exciting work, and uh, you know it's I think we've picked up some traction after the winter break. More to, more to come. It's exciting work. Uh, teacher evaluation. Um, the teacher evaluation team meets monthly, and uh, they uh, parts of the team will meet on vacation to go. We're working on a draft that will be given to the state um, to approve our teacher evaluation um, team. Wow. Um, how they how they do? <laughs> We're working, good. Yeah. So we're working on a draft. What, the, what exactly? The, the, we don't think the state is going to collect the full draft. They have a series of questions that we believe we're going to be asked to answer that, that highlight pieces of what are incorporated in our draft. Um, but yes, this group is now meeting pretty regularly in efforts to sort of lay out what the plan will look like for the pilot year, which is proposed to be next year. And I would say uh, working on it sentence by sentence. Um, it is not light work that anyone is breezing over, but it's serious um, in looking at every sentence from three different directions to make sure we've got representing all staff. Um, it's good work, I think. Yeah. So I have a procedural question on that. At what point or is it appropriate to have that not in front of the board to have any legislative governance over, but just out of curiosity about how that's 
shaping so, up. So currently we have board representatives to that. Essentially right now what we're proposing is our pilot. And so the pilot would move forward. There's a steering committee that is appointed as a part of that process. And ultimately our final plan has to be adopted by the board. So we certainly will share with you a draft once it's complete and ready to be submitted to the state, but the board isn't required to adopt it at that stage. It would be once we have a completed plan a year from now. So in looking forward for agenda items, should that be a, a business meeting agenda item, or do you think we should workshop that so that we can? I think it likely would be a business meeting item, okay. probably in May. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Nice to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, sort of. I wouldn't say anyone sees the light at the end of the tunnel, but Sarah Harrington has done, and Meredith uh, has led the group, and um, everyone's working very hard. Any other committee updates or reports? Um, the library building committee is still meeting and uh, picking furniture. Uh, it's meeting tomorrow. If anyone wants public meeting, if anyone wants in on furniture choices. Wow. Yeah. And the side of the building will be painted yellow to see if the town likes the color yellow, the feedback. But it's um, moving along. And the library is currently open, so it's open. don't feel like you don't have to. Um, it's an adventure. We went there yeah. the other day. It's, it's, yeah, it's great. It's, it's That's more fun. <laughs> One color at a time. Um, I do want to just point out that. Do you have any committee reports? Uh, I'm sorry? No. I, no. Do I have building grounds? Do you have any committee reports? I'm sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt you. I do. You look like you were oh, no. dying to jump in. Um, I just also wanted to point out, not only are we all serving on various other subcommittees, but then we're also still actively um, pursuing negotiations with three different collective bargaining units. So I cannot personally thank you all enough for the enormous amount of time and effort that you have all put in. Four, yes. All right, so I'm in denial, so it's four. It's still, it's a lot of work and um, I'm just so incredibly proud of the hard work that this board puts in. So just want to make sure you're all recognized for that because it's volunteer. It's a pleasure to serve. Um, with that, uh, any upcoming meetings that we should know about? Item 8 first. Any agenda? <laughs> I know. I was going to, I was going to, yeah. Uh, item 8, school board agenda requests. <laughs> Just the evaluation and the policy for workshops. Um, item nine, announcements of upcoming meetings. So uh, the proposed date for the first wellness committee meeting this year is May 5th at 3.20 p.m. It is a committee of about 20 people by policy. So I'm setting dates and hopefully as many people as possible can join us, but it's a pretty cumbersome committee to try to manage schedules for. Did I hear you say 3.20 p.m.? No? May 5th at 3.20 p.m. Not 3.30, not no. 3.15. No. Okay. That is a really precise it is. coordination. I'm impressed. Um, any other news? May I? stretch upcoming meetings slightly to just make note that two Cape Elizabeth High School graduates, Thomas and Peter Campbell, on uh, May 1st in this chambers will be sharing Cape Elizabeth uh, tides rising, times rising tides will be uh, a commissioned documentary film on the history of Cape Elizabeth, it will be shown in this room as part of the 250th and it celebrates our local uh, talented graduates, as well as is the kickoff to the 250th anniversary events. I'd love to invite all you there. It's uh, from 6 to 8 o'clock, a drop-in reception on May 1st. Wonderful. Just the board's next workshop. Um, we have, first of all, the budget will be presented to the town council on Monday, April 27th. 
Tuesday, April 28th, the school board workshop in the high school library at 6.30 will be discussing proficiency-based graduation. Um, that day is actually our on-site visit from the Department of Education to look at how we're doing with our work towards standards-based grading, proficiency-based graduation. Should we bring you chocolate? I don't think so. April 28th. 27th is the school board presentation of the budget to the town council, and Tuesday, April 28th, is the school board workshop. 7? 6.30 for the workshop, 7 o'clock for the town council meeting on Monday. Any other meetings? Uh, teacher evaluation, April 21st from 8 to 12 is um, a working group um, on the draft and then the second full meeting, uh, full committee meeting is Thursday, April 30th at 3.30. It's a hard working group. Any other meetings for the school board? 27th. Okay. With that, may I have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to <laughs> adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Thank you.